Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Pamela Singla. I am a professor at the Department of Social Work, University of Delhi. The topic for this session is Rural Women in India, Their Concerns, Interventions and Success Stories. After this session, you will be able to develop insight into the lives of rural women and the challenges faced by them in their daily lives. You will also be able to understand the need to organize rural women for community engagement, examine self-help groups as intervention strategy for the self and community empowerment, and you will also be able to study success stories for the self and community empowerment. I begin with introducing this session to you. We all know that India is a federal state comprising 29 states and 7 union territories. But or I can say despite 70 decades of the country's independence, 68.84% of the country's population resides in the rural India. According to the United Nations, till 2050, India would continue to have the largest rural population. Women comprise approximately half of the total population of India and a large majority of these women reside in the rural areas. The population of the rural women who are literate is 58.8% as per the census 2011. The rural population is characterized by poverty, absence of basic amenities, illiteracy, large unorganized sector and lack of access to resources. The women residing in the rural areas live in even deplorable conditions and in addition to the mentioned deprivations, they face chronic malnourishment, growth retardation, increasing poverty, various diseases, rising crimes against women to name a few. This large number of rural population, particularly the women, needs to be organized for development and that to sustainable development in the villages. One of the ways to empower the rural women is to, within courts, organize them around issues of their concern and around national interests so that they have better lives and which gives India a higher development index, what we commonly know as HDI. The paper is divided into three sections. Section 1 describes the concerns engulfing the women of rural India and the need to organize them. The section 2 of the paper explains the concept of self-help groups, commonly known as the SHGs, as an intervention strategy of organizing the poor women. And section 3 highlights some of the success stories of the SHG members at the micro level. With section 1, which is on issues and concerns of rural women. The situation of women in rural India is alarming and of concern even after decades of country's independence. Despite government's efforts, their life is marked by poor health status, illiteracy or low level of literacy, absence of control over resources and livelihood concerns. Discrimination towards girls starts right from the time they are born in the form of deprivation of education, good food and good care, absence of all these. Since most of the rural households are living in abject poverty, it is the woman of the house who is most affected in terms of nutrition. The Indian rural women have long working hours with their day beginning early in the morning and continuing till late night. For instance, in the state of Rajasthan, it is seen that the women spend three hours cooking and serving, two hours in fetching water from the well, five hours in cleaning and laundry, eight to nine hours in field during the peak sessions. Now, studies conducted in the state of Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, Punjab, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra and Haryana confirm the long working hours of women and extensive involvement in farm activities doing back breaking tasks such as transplantation, weeding, threshing, reaping, looking after the cattle etc. Alongside the women are expected to be performing all these tasks without grumbling. Another important feature is that even after doing so much of work comprising of both non-farm and farm activities, their work is not recognized and they are considered as non-workers in the census. Besides this, they are denied basic rights such as rights to equal wages, right to land holding, no role in decision making at the family level and issues regarding entrepreneurship. Now, a lot of studies have been done by them on this by the Sai, Kondavati and Kumbhar. The plight can be seen in the form of this picture where the two women are carrying fodder and wood as headloads. 
the fodder is for animals while the wood is for lighting the fire for food and this picture was taken at the Patiala district Punjab. Similarly, again one sees here a rural family involved in cutting fodder for its animals. Now, this is a picture again that has been taken, uh, this is in Haryana and basically this reflects another important aspect concerning women that is with the opening of the Indian economy to the outside world, the rural women have further faced loss of livelihood due to loss of demand of their traditional or indigenous products. It thus gets very important that these women are organized around sources of income and gradually made aware of the government schemes. The situation thus calls for immediate and systematic organizing the poor with the objective of enabling them to work collectively to improve their quality of life by competing for these scarce resources. One of the active ways of doing so is to help them to help themselves, which basically means through self-help, the mantra for professional social workers. Why organize the poor women? This is a pertinent question and basically it can be addressed by saying that development has impacted only a small fraction of women and that also those residing in the urban areas. Lives of women in general and particularly in the rural areas revolve around their household chores. This is because they have been mentally tuned to this line of intervention. It thus gets very important to generate awareness among them about their surroundings so that they are in better control of their lives. Thus, organizing them with specific aims gets to be very important. Now, in this slide, we talk about nine major points which tells us why we need to organize the rural women. First one is to establish a forum in which women can critically analyze their situation and devise collective strategies to solve their problems. Second, to provide a vehicle for promotion of economic activities and economic self for better living, to establish a gender equality in society, to develop social status in family and society. The fifth point is to encourage poor women to save and utilize their savings so as to lend to the needy. Sixth and very important to reduce dependency on women on money lenders, also to build up savings as old age security for women to build up confidence and mutual support for women striving for social change and finally to establish linkages with banks, government agencies and other related institutions for socio-economic development. We come to section 2 which is on interventions through the self-help groups. The philosophy, I, I begin with this self-help groups concept and the philosophy of social work profession is to help people to help themselves, however individual efforts may prove to be ineffective and thus needs external help. As put by Carmaker, individual efforts are too inadequate to improve the fate of the poor. Thus it is necessary to organize them in a group by which they get the benefit of the collective perception decision making. According to him, since formation of a group of the poor has shown best participation in credit program, savings and credit, it can be a good starting point for group formation called self-help groups. The concept of self-help group has been expressed by authors in different ways, but the underlying idea is the same, that is the entry point of an SRG is always economic in the given context. This is because the need of the poor is survival, and till this does not happen, their surroundings and environment definitely does not interest them. Now, the SRGs are, so um, as you can see on this screen, the SRGs have been defined in various ways by various scholars like Karmaker, Fisher and Sriram, Vata, Brabra and Mahanta. And they all look at SRGs in a specific way, which is common. Like Karmaker says, they are informal groups of people who pool their savings, re-lend in the group on rotational basis depending on the needs and they can also be seen as micro enterprises. Fisher and Sriram look at them as autonomous organizations formed through the savings of the group members. They also look at it as a bank which is managed by the people themselves. Wata says that SSGs are small, informal and homogeneous groups with not more than 20 members and the group correct regularly collects a fixed amount of thrift from each member. Barbara and Mahanta make a very important point that is people from economically backward classes 
and SCST community account for a sizable proportion of the SHE membership. Now, this is a self-help group in operation where you can see the coordinator or the person who is responsible trying to help the women of the self-help groups in administering their notebook. Now, this is again another photograph, photo of seven, which was taken by myself in Madhupur, Jharkhand, where the members of the successful and the not successful SAGs had come together to share their experiences. Similarly, this was meeting myself, meeting the self-help groups in their field, because it gets also very important to see the kind of developments which have happened in the field and also to listen to the grievances of the people. Now, there are a few and simple user friendly guidelines given below, while which have to be kept in mind while forming a self-help groups. Group size, this should preferably be between 10 to 20, preferably 15. Group fund, group members create a common fund by contributing their savings. Elected positions, the self-help groups have three elected portfolios, namely of the president, treasurer and secretary. Savings, the amount of money to be deposited by the members and the frequency of the contribution have to be decided by the group. It can be weekly, on weekly basis, monthly basis or bi-monthly basis. The savings can be collected as per the decision of the group. Then regular attendance of the members is compulsory. Also important is that rules be framed on aspects regarding loans, such as the limit for the loan, in case more than one person is asking for the loan, how it is to be entertained, the rate of interest to be charged, fine on the delay in repayment of loan, non-repayment of the loan, or maybe trying to hijack the benefits of the self-help group for his or her benefit. Then it is very important that documentation be done correctly. Documentation includes attendance register and proceedings register, savings and loan register, savings passbook, loan passbook, rules and regulations register, etc. However, documentation is to be kept to the minimum for the benefit of the members. Now, this is um, the same thing has been explained pictorially and for easy, for a bird's eye view of what exactly are the common aspects of a self-help group. The SAG functions primarily on the mutual trust between members. The aim of the group should thus be to have transparency in the functioning of the group. And this I think is much apparent after the previous discussion that we've had. The group can also frame laws on how much loan to be given for consumption purposes and how much for the productive purposes. For their formation and sustenance, it is essential that the SAGs are linked with an agency such as the non-government organizations or the banks. I bring to your kind attention some of the success stories that we have had in the case of self-help groups and the cooperatives. And the primary or the fourth most is Ilabhat Self-Employed Women's Association, commonly known as SEVA, which is in Ahmedabad and also has a daily office. G.R.O. Nachlam's Working Women's Forum, commonly known as the WWF, which is in Chennai. Then, of course, a lesser known but very diligent organization, Holy Cross Social Service Center at Hazari Bagh, Bihar. Then, Goonj, which is in Delhi and has its offices in the other states. And they are some of the nationally and internationally recognized names which have mobilized poor women around cooperatives and the self-help groups. This section looks into some of the success stories at the micro level and at individ and the individual cases that have benefited by getting organized around the self-help groups. The section is divided into two parts. Part 1 reviews the existing literature to bring out the benefits incurred to the SAG members, while part 2 is based on the author's fieldwork experiences with the SAGs in various parts of the country. So, we look at part 1 and we see that the literature says women, that women's group dominate the self-help groups and various scholars have said that. Reasons could be feminization of poverty. Now, there are 320 million poor in India out of which two-thirds are women and according to the World Bank, organizing women around thrift and credit services is seen as most effective method for poverty elevation and empowerment of women. 
Now, the literature review on empowerment of women through the self-help groups shows that self-help groups have instilled financial discipline among women. Though they take small loan, but it helps in meeting the requirements of the poor women. It has helped to improve their income levels. Social empowerment and economic progress through self-help groups have outpaced benefits from other rural development programs, which is very important to be understood. There have been seen increase in family incomes of the self-help group women members, not only improved the access of women to credit, but also reduced their dependency on money lenders. It has been seen that they have better control over their labor, they feel relatively free to move and interact with officials, they have assumed leadership positions and have shown better control over their reproductive health. They get more respect from their families. The exchange of information and experience between members because of the SSG platform itself is a learning. Mirada has 85 percent of its self-help groups constituted of women and they list the benefits accruing to its self-help group members. They say that it has helped in building leadership capacities of the poor, they get elected to the village panchayat, they are approached by the other groups of the village to help them with their problems, especially when these women belong to the poor and low caste who are not easily accepted as agents of change. The women as per Mirada are maintaining more than one assets, they are confident to speak to government officials and other visitors. Some had even left the SSG membership to borrow directly from the bank which gives them bigger loans. I now would like to share some of my experiences of working with the women who have been members of the SSGs in different parts of the country. The women members of the successful SSGs in Madhupur which is in Jharkhand had over a period of time through their savings and bank loans been able to earn a livelihood in various ways such as taking land on lease and the members taking turns to cultivate the land, purchase of nursery and selling of the plants, buying of goats both individually and in group. They were joined by their husbands and men from their households in their work and it became like a family occupation. So the whole point is that family as a unit came up with the coming of, of the self-help groups. Similarly, I'd like to share another one another experience at K. Slam Madhya Pradesh. The SSG women were trained by the very well-known organization Pradhan in vocations such as poultry keeping, mushrooming and sericulture. Besides the training, Pradhan had also helped them in identifying the markets for their products. As a result of all these efforts, the members have had an improved livelihood, a better quality of life and a feeling of dignity and empowerment. So we just spoke about Pradhan and on the screen is the woman utilizing her training in broiler production. So uh, poultry, uh, one of the occupations given by Pradhan to them was or the training given by Pradhan to them was in poultry. So this is the lady who had undergone the training and you can see her taking care of the chicks. The next one is the mushroom training and you can see this lady drying mushrooms in the sun. Sericulture is another one. and in Kesla, mulberry and castor and mulberry silkworm is reared and this is Gulshan Bai shed. You see them on the leaf where they are being nurtured. Again another example, the women at Madla village, Udaipur district, Rajasthan specifically expressed that now they did not hesitate to go to the market alone or in groups or approach the local police station for filing an FIR. They were aware of the health services being provided by the government and did not hesitate to demand them from the panchayat in the form of a primary health center or maybe a fair price shop. It is important for me to also mention a case which is of this lady called Devi which, who was a member of the self-help group at K. Islam Madhya Pradesh and was a role model for many local women. She said that her family of eight members had survived on 250 grams of rice and forest vegetation. Now with the intervention of Pradhan, their capacities were built and they had become more aware of their surroundings and the government schemes. So in conclusion to this entire session, I can say that the primary purpose of organizing and unorganizing poor women is to create better living conditions for them and better working conditions so as to empower them as a class. In fact, to the self-help groups for providing voice to the once voiceless and make such 
remarkable differences to the lives of the many. Thank you.